First Samuel, First Samuel 2, a great Sunday, but we're back in it tonight. First Samuel chapter 26, First Samuel chapter 26. There's a couple of things in chapter 24 I, we didn't preach on, we did preach on that chapter, but I think there's one thing that's very interesting when you look at David's, uh, in chapter 24, David cut off the bottom of Paul, uh, Saul's robe, and of course in chapter 26, we're going to see David takes uh, Saul's water bottle, his canteen, or whatever you want to call that, his cruise of water, and his spear. But it's interesting, in both after taking those things, when David speaks to Saul, you'll notice that he's not accusatory, he's not ugly, he's not being spirited. In both situations, he responds to Saul, and he gives a soft answer. When the soft answer turns away wrath, so that's an interesting note from both chapter 24 and chapter 26. Something also interesting on the road, cutting off the bottom of the road, and we could preach a message on this, but that, that road, that aspect of the road represented authority. By cutting that off, holding that up, he was just reminding Saul once again, God was, and you can run the, the scriptures on that, is that that represented authority, and that Saul's authority had been lost. He had lost the authority that had been taken from him because of his sin, is disobedience to what God would have him to do. So just a couple extra thoughts there. But tonight we're going to look at the idea of overcoming temptation. Overcoming temptation. That's what we find in 1 Samuel chapter 26. Now the word tempt, Webster's Dictionary defines the word tempt as this. Listen to the definition. To entice, to do wrong by promise of pleasure or gain. To entice, to do wrong by promise of pleasure or gain. I don't answer out loud, but have you ever been tempted? Obviously. Uh, some of you are thinking, are you tempting me now <laughs> to, to lie or not lie? But anyway, uh, but seriously, we all have been through temptation. We deal with temptation. Even our Lord and Savior Himself, Jesus Christ, was led into the wilderness, the Bible says, where He was tempted of the devil. Of course, the difference with Christ is that he never gave in to Satan's temptations. He was tempted, the Bible says, in all points like as you and I are. And then that, it says, but yet without sin in Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 15. Now, we know that temptation comes from many different sources. As again, it says to entice, to do wrong by promise of pleasure or gain. Uh, temptation comes from Satan. We see that in 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 5. Also, 1 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 5. So temptation in our life can come from Satan. Uh, we also see that temptation can come from our own fleshly lusts. James chapter 1, verses 13 and 14. In Matthew chapter 26, verse 41, Jesus said, you need to, be, you need to stay alert. Uh, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And so it can come from Satan. Temptations can come from our own flesh. Temptation can come from other people. Matthew 22, 18, Luke 20, 23, and John chapter 8, verse 6, deal with situations where uh, the Pharisees, the leadership is talking to Jesus. They're trying to tempt him. And he says in those verses, you'll find that phrase, why tempt ye me? And so temptation can come from other people. Another verse, 1 Timothy 6, verse 9, tells us that temptation can come from a desire for wealth. Desire for wealth. And so four areas that temptation can come from. We've all experienced temptation. And sad to say, we know what it is to be overcome by temptation. We know what it is to fail and to fall because of temptation. And if we were to be honest, it's not a good feeling when we compromise what we know is right what we know God's will is for temporary gratification. And uh, even though it's, it, it's, that, it's that promise of pleasure or gain, here's the thing, it never lasts. And then, and then we're back to remorse and feeling bad and talking bad about ourselves. And then the dumps because of that temporary gratification. It brings heartache and it causes us as believers to lose our joy because we gave in to the temptation. But there's, there, there is good news for those of us that are saved. Is that we can overcome temptation. Say, why is that? Well, number one, our example, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, He overcame it. Is that right? Okay. And then when you got saved, when you trusted Christ as your Savior, the one who overcame temptation now lives where? Within us. And so greater is He that is in you than He that is in the world. Because the one that is within us has overcome temptation. 
He was tempted the devil. He was yet without sin. And so that's who lives within us. So we have, through Christ, the ability to overcome temptation. Now, in our chapter tonight, you're wondering if we're ever going to get there. In our chapter tonight, David encounters incredible temptation. He has a fantastic, you might say, opportunity to take revenge on the man who has ruined his life. The man who's been hunting him and chasing him. And his, his parents are in Moab and his family's over there and he's just been on the run. And now he has a perfect opportunity to take care of this problem. How did David overcome the temptation and do what was right. For how did he overcome that temptation and do what was right? How did he overcome such an incredible temptation to sin? And so there's some very applicable lessons in this chapter for us tonight. So let's pray. And then we'll, we'll look at the first five verses. And we're just going to work our way down uh, through the chapter tonight. Lord, we again thank you for the opportunity to be here tonight. The prayer time, the singing time. Lord, a lot of needs out there. Uh, Lord, there's not physical needs. There's a lot of spiritual needs. I pray that we're honest with ourselves tonight as we look at this chapter. We see David and we see the great temptation before him. And we see how, Lord, he was able to overcome it. We would take that, Lord, and remember that and apply it to our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, the first thing you see, let's read verses 1 through 5. It says, And the Ziphites came unto Saul to Gibeah, saying, Doth not David hide himself in the hill of Achilah, which is before, which is before Jesh, Jesh Simon, Jesh Simon? Then Saul arose and went down to the wilderness of Ziph, having 3,000 chosen men of Israel with him to seek David in the wilderness of Ziph. And Saul pitched in the hill of Achilah, which is before Jeshimon, by the way. But David abode in the wilderness, and he saw that Saul came after him into the wilderness. David therefore sent out spies and understood that Saul was found in very deep. And David arose and came to the place where Saul had pitched. And David beheld the place where Saul lay. And Abner, the son of Ner, uh, the captain of his host, saw lay in the trench, and the people pitched round about him. First thing we see in how David overcame this great temptation in his life was, number one, David refused to allow the sin of others to influence him to sin. David refused to allow the sin of others to influence him to sin. We see in this chapter, he finds out where Saul is, so he sneaks up. Uh, to Saul's camp. He's checking it out there in verse 5, and he, he sees everybody is sleeping. Verse 12 tells us that a deep sleep from the Lord had fallen on all the men in Saul's camp, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. But here, lying in that trench of sleep is the man that is lying. Now listen, we've, we've, we've gone through the whole book, coming up here to this chapter. This man has lied to David. He has tried to kill David numerous times. He has broken promises to David. He's taken David's wife while he was gone to battle and gave her to another man. And here he is, a man that's caught all this heartache in his life, is laying down there snoring away, literally within spitting distance of David. But don't you know there was a voice in David's head that was saying, listen, revenge is sweet, David. That voice was saying, hey, put an end to all this foolishness right now. Hey, David, why don't you take matters into your own hands and get rid of him? Listen, David, Saul's nothing but scum. He doesn't deserve to live. Look what he's done to you. Look what he's done to the nation of Israel. Listen, David, he deserves everything. Everything he's given. And so you can begin to imagine the temptation in David's mind and heart. But David would not allow what Saul did. He would not allow the sin of Saul and the wrongdoing of Saul to influence him to sin and commit murder. Now, we're not saying that self-defense is wrong here, but this wasn't self-defense. If David snuck in there and killed Saul, it would murder. It had been different if this was hand-to-hand -hand combat and Saul was coming after him and something like that, he had a right to defend himself just as he did with Goliath, just as he did in battle. This wasn't the case. See, David knew it would be wrong to slip in there to murder, to kill the king of Israel. Look at verse 10 real quick. Verse 10 says, David said, Furthermore, as the Lord liveth, the Lord shall smite him, or his day shall come to die, or he shall descend into battle and perish. The Lord forbid that I should stretch forth my hand against the Lord's anointed. David saying, Listen, God anointed him to be king, and God can dispose of him at 
the right time and the right timing. And many times what happens with us is that we allow the sin of others. Now listen to me. We allow the sin of others to justify our sins. We do. Hey, I, I cheated on him because he did such and such to me. I stole it because he did this or that to me. You know, I committed adultery because my wife went out and did this. I cheated now and lost my temper because he said such and such. And, and so we justify our sin because of their sin. Take your Bible, go to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. Now that's our society today. Uh, it justifies everything. Well, it doesn't, but that's contrary to Scripture. Romans chapter 12, look at verse 19. Romans 12, verse 19. Paul is writing to you and I, New Testament believers. Brittany and Ezra are in the house, just so you know. Amen. All right, Romans chapter 12, and look at verse 19. He said, Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. We talked about that last week. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the who? The Lord. And then look at verse 21. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. And so that's Paul's instruction to you and I. We've heard this expression, two wrongs don't make a correct. Two wrongs don't make a right, and that's so true. Some of you may be sitting here tonight, and we're talking about vengeance, <laughs> talking about someone's done me wrong, and you're thinking, I'd say, I'd like that. No. Well, if I had the opportunity, no. Let the Lord take care of it. Let the Lord take care of it. Don't be sitting there plotting revenge. How many of you have lost a good night's sleep? Replaying some situation in your mind. Hey, I, we did that again. <laughs> we ought to have done all the things right now. And you, and you can't get any sleep because you're replaying vengeance. Well, I see that if I ever run into them again, they're going to be sorry. I'll tell you what. Your wife's like, who are you talking to? Nobody. <laughs> and we plot. And it's not our place. Leave it alone. Leave it alone. And David said, hey, even though he's done me wrong, I'm not going to sin. His wrong, his sin doesn't justify me going and sinning. And so that's the first thing. Number two tonight. So David refused to allow the sin of others to influence him to sin. It's kind of quiet there during that illustration. Some of y'all really in your plot and something. Number two, David refused to allow friends. David refused to allow friends to influence him to sin. We see that in verses 6, 7, and 8. So let's go back and read those verses real quick. 1 Samuel 26, and look at verses 6, 7, and 8. So they've snuck up here to the camp. He has. He's checked it out. Look what he says in verse 6. Then answered David and said to Himelech, the Hittite, and to Abishai, the son of Zariah, brother of Joab, saying, Who will go down with me to Saul to the camp? And Abishai said, I will go down with so David and Abishai came to the people by night, and behold, Saul lay sleeping within the trench, and his spear stuck in the ground at his bolster. But Abner and the people lay round about him. Then said Abishai to David, God, look what he says, God hath delivered thine enemy into thy hand this day. Now therefore let me smite him, I pray thee, with a spear even to the earth at once, and I will not smite him the second time. David refused to allow friends to influence him to sin. So David says, hey, let's get a closer look at this situation. Hey, you two, who wants to go with me? Abishai, that's actually David's nephew. And we can tell by his response here, he's probably cut from the same mold that David was cut from. And so here's these two guys going down to a camp that's got 3,000 soldiers. Now, Ahimelech, he doesn't say anything. He probably said, hey, I'll, I'll be praying for you two while you go. I'll hang back and you know, keep an eye on things. But he didn't go, but Abishai did now listen, Abishai was not going down there to take in the landscape. Uh, he was ready to go down there and do some business. We see that in verses 7 and 8. And here's a, here's a modern day translation. He said, David, if you just say the word, I'm going to go right in there and I'll shish kebab Saul with his own sword. And no one's going to hear a peep. And believe me, when I, and I won't have to do it twice. I'll do it with one blow and take him out. Now listen, that's very tempting because it wouldn't be David killing him. It would be Abishai. So David could I honestly say, I didn't kill him. I didn't murder him. I didn't, I didn't do anything wrong. Abishai did it. 
See the temptation there? But David's response in verse 9, he says, And David said to Abishai, Destroy him not. For who can stretch forth his hand against the Lord's anointed and be guiltless? It's amazing that David would not allow, listen, not only friends, but he wouldn't allow family to influence him to do wrong. What will you do? What would you do when other people say to you, Hey, listen, you owe it to yourself to do that. Listen, you deserve it. Go for it. Everybody does. Don't you love that one? Everybody does. You only live once. Oh, it's the opportunity of a lifetime. Here's what you need to remember. You, you will give account to God, not your friends, for your choices. You will give an account to God for your choices. Your friends aren't going to do that. God's not going to call you up and your friends are. He's going to call you up. And you will give an account for your decisions. You will give an account for your choices. Period. Don't allow your friends and family to influence you to sin. David knew this. Now listen, Abishai may have been the instrument, but David would have been responsible. Amen. I don't know if I've ever told this story here, but years ago, we were little kids, we were shipping mom was shopping, and uh, way back when, what we would do with mom was shopping was we would collect needles. They always had needles in the clothes, you know, shirt collar. And Lori and I would collect them and see if we could get the most needles. Mom was in a checkout line talking to a lady. And I told Laura, I said, why don't you take that needle? Go over there and put her behind her. Now she, she was the instrument, but I, I wasn't responsible. And so with being a good little sister, she went right over there. Boop! <laughs> and I got spanked. I, I didn't do it. You sent her. <laughs> I did. And, uh, so anyway, it would have been the same thing here. So I would kill him. But you let him go. You sent him into camp to kill that guy. Now you kids, do not go anywhere with that story, all right? That is bad, bad, bad. Do not do that. We have other stories, but we won't share those tonight. And so we see two things tonight. First, David refused. Listen, he refused to allow the sin of others to influence him to sin. Number two, David refused to allow friends or family to influence him to sin. Let's pick up in verse 9 again. David said to Abishai, destroy him not. For who can stretch forth his hand against the Lord's anointed to be guiltless? David said, furthermore, as the Lord liveth, the Lord shall smite him. For his day shall come to die, or he shall descend into battle and perish. The Lord forbid that I should stretch forth my hand against the Lord's anointed. But I pray to thee, take thou now the spear that is at his bolster, his pillow, whatever he's resting his head on, and the cruise of water, and let us go. So David took the spear and the cruise of water from Saul's bolster, and they gapped them away. And no man knew it, nor uh, and no man saw it, nor knew it, neither awaked, for they were all asleep, because a deep sleep from the Lord had fallen upon them. Number three, David refused to allow circumstances, circumstances to influence him to sin. Now I want to pause and look at verse 12 for just a minute. That phrase there, deep sleep from the Lord was falling upon them. I'm going to just give you a couple of quick notes. I was going to preach on this, but uh, perhaps not going to allow it. Let me just give you a couple of quick thoughts on this. You run that idea and that phrase and that thing of deep sleep through your Bible. And, uh, and of course, here in chapter 26, we have that God, God allowed a deep sleep for protection from their enemies. He gave David and Abishai protection from their enemies. They, they were sound asleep. They got in and they got out. God caused a deep sleep to fall upon. Of course, when I say deep sleep, you, your mind, should automatically go back to Genesis chapter 2 and think of who? Adam. God caused a deep sleep to come upon Adam, and God did surgery, opened him up, took that rib out, and so a deep sleep would come upon uh, you and I for God's protection, God's protection from pain. In Genesis chapter 15, uh, there's, uh, if you get into uh, verses 7 through 16, but especially verse 12, you see that there's a great spiritual battle taking place there. And, 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 and it's to such a point that, that God says the best thing from Abram right now is just to go to sleep. And so you find God's protection from satanic warfare in deep sleep. In Job chapter 33, verses 12 through 20, uh, you'll find it talks about there that uh, God will put a man to sleep that God may speak 
with that man's desires laid aside. Hey, that everything, the distraction, everything's put aside so God can deal with that man one on one. And uh, Proverbs chapter 19, verse 15, it's a very interesting uh, thought here, but God's uh, deep sleep is God's judgment upon those that won't work. And then Isaiah 29, verses 9 through 12, a very powerful passage, but we can see that a deep sleep comes upon people, and it's God's judgment upon those that reject His word. Reject his word. And so if you took those notes, that'd be a good little Bible study for you right there in regards to deep sleep. But notice Abishai's response in verse 8. Now listen, David refused to allow the circumstance, to allow circumstances to influence him to sin. But look what Abishai said to him in verse 8. Then said Abishai to David, look what he said, God hath delivered thine enemy into thine hand this day. So let me go in there and stick it to him. See, he reads, he said, listen, David, listen, David, this must be God's will for you. I mean, how else can we explain it? Here we are, there he is, everybody's sound asleep. We can go in there and take care of him. This must be God's will for you to eliminate Saul. You know, it's like saying, hey, the stars are aligned, and it's just the perfect timing there. Uh, circumstances show you that God is in this. Uh, don't we use the same excuse to justify wrong actions and bad decisions so many times? Well, you know, everything just seemed to line up. Well, okay, but did it line up with the Bible? See, that's what we forget. See, it, David can easily say, this is not of God, because the Bible says, thou shalt not kill. And if I just go in there and kill, I, that's committing murder. It's against God's law. So this is not from God. It may look like it's from God, but it's not from God. You have to be careful. There's a great danger in trying to read or interpret circumstances to discern God's will. Say, why is that? Because God speaks to you from His Word. And God speaks to you through the Holy Spirit. He does not speak to you and I from subjective circumstances that happen in life. You say, why is that? Because circumstances change. And when they change, guess what else changes? Your feelings. Has anybody ever told you a story? And you're like, I'm going to go in there and get them. And then you hear the other side of the story. Wow. But had you based on the first half of the story, see, circumstances change. You cannot say, it's God's will because of this, this, and that. No, does it line up with God's word and the Holy Spirit speaking to you? And David said, this isn't of God. This is murder. And that's not of God. Of course, Abishai, he's like, come on. It's got to be God's will. Look at this opportunity that God has put before you. Again, look at verse 8 again. He says, God hath delivered thy enemy into thy hand this day. It has to be from the Lord. It's a great opportunity. Listen, I've been around long enough, lived long enough, and dealt with people long enough. And there's been plenty of opportunities that have led believers right into a dead-end street. Into a dead-end street. And I'll tell you, not only does it take them to a dead end street, it takes them right out of fellowship with God. Well, it was an opportunity. It wasn't of the Lord. Never interpret circumstances as divine, as divine okay to sin. Amen. They're never, God's never going to give you things that okay is your sin. Why? Because you always regret it later. David would have regretted. David probably would have been king had he gone kill Saul. So a quick review, number one, David refused to allow the sin of others uh, to cause him to sin. Number two, David refused to allow friends to influence him to sin. Number three, David refused to allow circumstances to influence him to sin. And then the fourth thing I want you to see is that David totally rested in the Lord. He totally rested in the Lord. Look at verse 13. Then David went over to the other side and stood on the top of the hill far off in a great space between them. No doubt, <laughs> Saul was a crazy guy. And David cried to the people and to Abner, the son of uh, Ner, saying, Answerest thou not, Abner? Then Abner answered and said, Who art thou that cries to the king? And David said, Abner, art not thou a valiant man? But who is like to thee in Israel? Wherefore then hast thou not kept thy lord the king? For there came one of the people in to destroy the king, thy Lord. Ooh, calling him out on the carpet there, isn't he? He said, aren't you the king's bodyguard? 
Well, you didn't do your job tonight. Let's keep reading. This thing is not good to thou hast done. As the Lord liveth, ye are worthy to die, because ye have not kept your master, the Lord's anointed. And now see where the king's spear is and the cruise of water that was at his bolster. Saul knew David's voice. And he said, Is this thy voice, my son David? He is, remember, David is his son in law. He's married to Michael. David said, It is my voice, my Lord, O king. And he said, Wherefore doth my Lord thus pursue after his servant? For what have I done? For what evil is in my hand? Now therefore I pray thee, let my Lord the king hear the words of his servant. If the Lord have stirred thee up against me, let him accept an offering. But if they be the children of men, cursed be they that before cursed be they before the Lord, for they have driven me out of this day from abiding in the inheritance of the Lord, saying, Go, serve other God. Now therefore let not my blood fall to the earth before the face of the Lord. For the king of Israel has come out to seek a flea, as one doth hunt a partridge in the mountains. Then says Saul, I have sinned. Return, my son David, for I will no more do thee harm, because my soul is precious in thine eyes this day. Behold, I have played the fool, and have erred exceedingly. And David answered and said, Behold, the king's spear, and let one of the young men come over and fetch it. The Lord rendered to every man his righteousness and his faithfulness. For the Lord delivered thee into my hand today, but I would not stretch forth my hand against the Lord's anointing. And behold, as thy life was much set by this day in my eyes, so let my life be much set be thy eye. Set by in the, in the eyes of the Lord, let him deliver me out of all tribulation. Saul said to David, Blessed be thou, my son David. Thou shalt both do great things. And also shall still prevail. So David went on his way and Saul returned to his palace. Number four, David totally trusted in the Lord. David took Saul's spear and he took his water bottle and he went way over to the top of the hill and began to holler and scream and to wake up Saul's men. He embarrassed Abner, caught him on the carpet. That's a message in itself. And then the Saul knew it was David. And David basically is saying here, he says, listen, I have your spear, I have your water, I could have killed you. It would have been really easy, but I didn't. This should show you, Saul, my innocence and show you the innocence of my heart. Job chapter 10 and verse 2 says, I, say, I will say unto God, do not condemn me, show me wherefore thou contendest with me. And that's what David's saying. Hey, show me, Saul, why? What, what have I done? What have I done to deserve this? And we saw there in verse 21, it says, then Saul said, I have sinned. Saul's heart was melted and he was overcome by David's kindness. Now listen, this is a pitiful sight here. He is pitiful. You, you, we've studied his life. He's up, he's down. He's up, he's down. He's up, and he's down. Up and down like a roller coaster. But it's really, and he says it himself here, and it's a real shame that when your biography is summed up with that one sentence in verse 21, I have played the fool. That's all. Talking about himself. And he had. He, his cry is one who has wrecked his life and he's realized it too late. It's too late to change. It's too late to make it a difference. Uh, there's someone in the New Testament, Judas Iscariot, did the same thing, but he realized it too late. He tried to go back and give the silver, like, we don't care what you do with that. We got what we wanted. It was too late. He, he couldn't get Jesus back from them. It was too late. If only Saul had realized this years earlier, he could have avoided many problems and avoided some heartaches in his life. And so before you tonight, before you play the fool, before you scar your life, before you wreck your life, listen, if you're not saved, trust Jesus Christ as your Savior, obey His Word, and serve Him daily. If you are saved, hey, listen, change course. Change course. Get back to reading God's Word. Get back to serving Him daily. Listen, don't play the fool. Because that's what the devil's going to make out of you. He'll make a fool out of you. Now listen, he said, why was Saul foolish? I put down a couple of things here. I put down he was foolish because he was contentious. He was, he was a troublemaker. It says, a fool's, lip, a fool's lips enter into contention, and his mouth calls for strokes. Proverbs 18, 6, that's Saul. Saul was meddlesome. It is an honor for a man to cease from strife, but every fool will be meddling. That was Saul. Proverbs 20, verse 3. He was cocky. Proverbs 28, 26. He that trusted in his own heart is a fool. Whoso walketh wisely, he shall be delivered. David's going to be delivered. He was hypocritical. In Luke chapter 11, the Lord said unto him, Now ye, now do ye Pharisees make clean the outside of the cup 
and the platter, but your inward part is full of ravening and wickedness. Ye fools, did not he that made that which is without make that which is within also? He says, you guys are a bunch of, a bunch of hypocrites. And that's what Saul was. Listen, he played the fool. Why? Because he listened to false representation of wicked men like Doeg. Doeg lied. And he goes in there and kills all 85 of those priests. Proverbs 18, 13. He that answereth the matter before he heareth it, it is folly and shame unto him. He opposed that which was right. James 4, 17. Therefore, to him who to do good, doeth it not to him, it is sin. Saul knew what was right and he wouldn't do it. He didn't obey God. He didn't kill all the Amalekites. He disobeyed. He disobeyed. He disobeyed. He's trying to kill David. He's opposing that which is right. He would make good resolutions and then he would immediately break them. Corrupting his conscience, hardening his heart, living in sinfulness. And David says, listen, send some guy, don't you come, but you send a man over here and fetch your stuff. David doesn't trust the king to personally deliver the spear and the water back to him. You say, why, why was that? Because Saul's talk never matched his walk, amen. And uh, he, the Bible says um, his pattern was, to, or I said his pattern was to talk, but, but no walk. The Bible says be a hearer. Not only be a hearer of the word, but be a what? A doer. Well, Saul was a hearer, but he was never a doer. James 1, verse 23. Now look back in 1 Samuel 26, look at verse 23. And the Lord says, The Lord render to every man his righteousness and his faithfulness. For the Lord delivered thee into my hand today, but I would not stretch forth my hand against the Lord's anointed. And behold, as thy life was much set by this day in mine eyes, so let my life be much set by in the eyes of the Lord. Let him deliver me out of all tribulation. David says, the Lord render every man his righteousness and his faithfulness. Now it's interesting, this is the first time the word faithfulness appears in your King James Bible. And when you begin to look at it, we could have done a study on this, but I, we, I knew we wouldn't have time. But faith simply this. Faithfulness is a trait that is sadly lacking in many believers today. Now, I just don't know what the Lord wants of me. Well, I can tell you right up front one thing the Lord wants of you. He, if you're saved, He wants you to be faithful. Amen. Hey, a lot of people, their whole problem, their whole saved life is they won't be faithful to the Lord. That's all He wants. He just wants you to be so what does he want from me? He wants you to be faithful. If you'll be faithful, then God, listen, God will build on that. But you have to commit to be faithful. That's what he's looking for. Hey, when you study the scriptures, you know what you find, especially when Christ was here on earth? Hey, God puts a premium on our faithfulness. He, it's, <laughs> I, I, I can't, I don't know, beat a dead horse. But he puts a premium. Say, so what's really important to God? Our faithfulness. That's a premium on faithfulness. So I, I can't preach and I can't do it. You can be faithful. Now I know that doesn't go over well, but it's the truth. I can't sing, I can't teach, I can't this. Can you be faithful? Oh, well, yes, you can. Yes, you can. Faithful, be faithful. See, Saul's trust was in his bodyguard. He had Abner there, 3,000 men all around him. They slept through the older day. No one had a clue David had been in and out. But David, his trust was completely in the Lord. Look what he says at the end of verse 24. He says, and let him deliver me, come up the Lord, out of all tribulation. David's trust was completely in the Lord. He, David knew that he didn't need to take matters into his own hands. He knew that he could leave it with the Lord and that God was faithful and that God was trustworthy. When temptation comes into our lives, and it has, and it will, it will, we have a clear choice. He said, well, what is it? We can either take matters into our own hands and do what we think, listen, do what we think is best for us, best for me, or what will bring us the most pleasure or gratification. That's your first choice. Or you can completely trust God and His Word and rest in Him. That's just a clear choice. Do what I want to do, and it's only going to be temporary. Or I can just trust in God, and He'll take care of it. So when temptation comes, listen, our choices will not only affect our future, but they also affect those around us. Not only our future, but those around us. Our choices alter our lives forever and have incredible impact on the course of our lives. 
overcoming temptation, doing what is right is seldom easy. I'm not going to lie to you. If it was easy, we'd all do right. It's seldom easy. It's difficult to do right, to make the right choices, to do the right thing. But boy, I tell you, the the rewards for doing right is unbelievable. And I'll tell you this. You'll never be sorry for doing right. Amen. I've never been sorry for doing right. Oh, I've been thankful. I praise God for it. Amen. Oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you, thank you, thank you, God. Thank you, Lord. I was, I was really out of breath. Thank God I did right on that. How many of you were speeding? You saw some brake lights up ahead. You let off. And you got up there. Guess what was there? Oh, thank the Lord. I wasn't speeding when I got here. Huh? Thank God you did right. I'm just going to blow by at 95. Off to the side we go. Listen, you'll never be sorry. Get that down, young people. You'll never be sorry you did right. Never be sorry. Now, if we can apply these principles from David's life, we can overcome temptation, and we can make wise choices in every area of our lives. First, David refused to allow the sin of others to influence him to sin. Second, David refused to allow friends slash family to influence him to sin. Third, David refused to allow circumstances. Well, come on, David, the Lord's been in here before. He's right here for you. He didn't allow circumstances to influence him to sin. David totally rested in the Lord. Look at verse 25, and I'll be mad. Then Saul said to David, Blessed be thou, my son David. Thou shalt both do great things, and also shalt still prevail. So David went on his way, and Saul returned to his place. It's a very climactic climatic parting here. Saul and David bid a final farewell. Uh, it was interesting. There's no, there's no record of Saul chasing David anymore after this. Not to say that he didn't, but there's no record of it. And, and also, there's, they never see each other again. And so it's interesting because as they part ways, it's very important as they part ways. Listen, David had nothing to be ashamed of. Because he had acted properly in regards to Saul. And Saul, but what's interesting, Saul says back in verse 2, I have sinned, but he shows no remorse. There's no tears. There's no repentance of his wrongdoing. His wrong Just because he said, I have sinned, so what? But doesn't mean he's sorry for it. And then he's repented of it at all. But I just want to ask you this question. It was well with David. It was not well with Saul. But is all well with you? Is all well with you if with you if today you bid this life a final farewell? If you checked out tonight, God called you home tonight, is all well. Is all well. It was well with David, it wasn't with Saul. Is it well with you tonight? How to overcome temptation? We see four practical lessons out of David's life. And the bottom line is, you'd never be sorry for doing right. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the time tonight. And I look at this chapter, and we would look at it and think, wow, what an opportunity. But as we know, so David's being tested, his character's being tested, it's being revealed. With some practical lessons to learn tonight. And I pray, Lord, that if you've spoken to our heart, you've highlighted something in the message, the Holy Spirit has pricked our conscience, and hey, I'm talking to you. That's for you, that Lord, that we won't be embarrassed or angry or upset about that. Lord, we're thankful that we respond as we ought. Uh, Lord, what you have showed us, what you have talked to us about, what you have revealed to us, uh, you know what's going on in our thoughts, you know the intents of our heart, or our motives, you know all of that. So it's nothing we can hide from you. So I pray, Lord, we'd be honest with you tonight and do what you would have us to do. Heads bowed, eyes closed,